Good Sunday morning to you, Prekaptans. Today I've got something very different for you. Remember last week or the week before when I said I was going to give my friend Eric an opportunity to create an episode of quote-unquote practical cynicism here on the podcast? Well, that is happening today. Eric is a really good friend of mine. He may be, in fact, I have no doubt that he is, the best friend I have. We have known each other for nearly 20 years. I think it's something like 16, 17 years. It's a pretty long time. And I hope this doesn't sound too big-headed of me to say, but Eric is the only friend I've ever felt was on the same level as me as far as interest in philosophy and the enjoyment of just thinking and talking about things. There is no one else on this planet that I have yet met that I feel confident I could talk to for 100 hours straight and not run out of things to talk about. We are both genuinely attracted to the process of thinking about things. That's kind of our idea of a good time. If you could imagine a more boring thing, let me know. (laughs) I don't have any other friends like that. So when Eric and I spoke about potentially airing a little bit of cynicism content on Practical Stoicism, we both got a little giddy over the idea. Of course, both of us understand that you, the listener, might hate this, and we need to know if you do hate it, because if you do hate it, we're not going to do it again. But here's the plan that we're kind of approaching this with. Today, you're going to hear a brief introduction to cynicism. Now, this is cynicism with a capital C, and it's going to be from Eric with a capital E. (laughs) And when it's over, I want you to click the link in the show notes to fill out a three-question anonymous survey, no names, no email addresses, totally anonymous, that is going to ask you for feedback about the content. If this content is well-received, Eric will create a weekly segment on cynicism. And if it continues to do well, you'll get another long-form episode every week where Eric, from the cynic perspective, and I, from the stoic perspective, discuss the previous week's meditations. If this does well, we will either A, continue doing it on this podcast as a regular recurring segment, or B, spin it off into its own Practical Cynicism standalone podcast. This podcast, Practical Stoicism, has a huge audience. More than a million downloads a month are projected by the end of next month. And I want to leverage that popularity as a way to test and spin off other standalone philosophy content properties, I guess we could call it. I don't know if that's something anyone cares about or will want, but I want to try it. And there's no better person for me to try this with initially than Eric. Before I play the audio recording from Eric, I want you to note a couple of things. Well, a few things. Number one, I'm in a professional recording booth on a $500 microphone. Eric is in his bedroom on a $70 microphone. The audio quality is not going to be as high. If there's a positive response to this, I'm going to be eating the cost of sending Eric into a professional studio every month. So think of this as a pilot episode. This is a low-budget test run. Number two... I have been performing scripted content for many years. Every episode of Practical Stoicism is scripted. I am reading right at this moment, and I've gotten rather good at that. Eric hasn't. By trade, Eric is a database administrator. His script reading sounds like script reading, but as he gets more practice, he will get better. So don't judge him too harshly here if he sounds a little stiff, okay? This isn't what he does every day. And number three, Eric is very funny. He's very dryly funny. This segment had me in absolute stitches because of all the references and snide comments that he's making. Now, if you're familiar with cynicism a little bit, you might get those references, but Eric is very funny. And I'm setting him up. You're not going to think he's funny, and that's going to make it worse. I'm doing that Jerry Seinfeld thing, but I think he's just the funniest guy, and I found this little segment to be hysterical. But with those caveats, lower audio quality, Eric doesn't create recorded content for a living, and he's super funny, so please watch out for that. With those caveats... Here's Eric with the pilot episode of Practical Cynicism. Hello, and welcome to the first episode of Practical Cynicism. My name is Eric DeMott, and you've heard me correctly. I did, in fact, say cynicism. Tanner has been gracious enough to allow me to interrupt your regularly scheduled dose of stoicism to share a new perspective on some familiar stoic topics. I've known Tanner for a very long time, and we've had many late nights discussing deeply philosophical ideas. These conversations only intensified after I went to college to study classical Greek, Latin, and philosophy. I've always enjoyed our consistently opposing views on pretty much everything, so when he asked me if I wanted to contribute to a Stoicism podcast, my first thought was to derail it completely and talk about cynicism. Graciously, he allowed it. 
For anyone cringing at the word cynicism, please be assured that it's cynicism with a capital C, the ancient philosophical school of cynicism that Zeno himself studied before making his way to the Stoa and founding Stoicism with a capital S. In fact, this philosophy of cynicism provides Stoicism's link back to Socrates as a sort of intellectual grandfather who sits in the corner of history, smiling knowingly, motionless in his rocking chair because the hemlock has paralyzed his limbs. But you didn't come here to learn about Socrates. You came here for Stoicism, which you will also not be getting today. At least, not directly. I thought it would be prudent of me to introduce cynicism by way of comparison and harking back to Tanner's first episode about the loss of a mug. Luckily, cynicism has its own mug story. In the first episode of Practical Stoicism, Tanner shared with you Marcus Aurelius' take on how to deal with the loss of a mug. Not just any mug, of course, but your favorite mug. The mug you love. The mug you use every day. The mug whose coffee perks you up when you're feeling groggy and whose tea calms you down when you are stressed. Yep, one day you butterfingers this mug and it shatters on the ground. You are understandably and equally shattered. I'm sure you know the feeling. Marcus isn't reminding us of this pain because he enjoys the suffering of others. He's not that kind of emperor. He wants to understand that we are partially to blame for the emotional pain we are feeling because in his view, we did not approach our relationship to the mug wisely. We did not build the eventuality of loss into our relationship with the mug. Not to be outdone by someone whose philosophy seems to only focus on mugs, Epictetus makes the same point about your wife and your children and suggests that the things we love most in our life are only on loan, borrowed goods, gifted to us by happenstance. And since they are borrowed, we must acknowledge upfront that they must be returned. Similar to the view from above, or memento mori, we are encouraged to look at the big picture and see life in its totality. Not just our life, but the lives of our loved ones in our cherished possessions. What my summary lacks in detail, it makes up for with brevity, and you'd do well to scroll back through the episodes and re-listen when you have the chance. Tanner says it all so much better than I do. But if you're still with me, I'd like to pick apart the elements of the story and provide a cynic counterpoint. The cynic version of the mug story is a bit more terse and dramatic. Less thought experiment and more performance art. Picture an ancient Greek man wrapped in a very used toga with nothing but a walking stick and a satchel over his shoulder. Approaching a fountain in a city street, he digs into his satchel and easily retrieves his cup. It's likely his favorite since it's the only one he has. Besides the walking stick, it might be the only thing he has. Nevertheless, he dips the cup into the fountain to slake his thirst, only to be interrupted by a very young boy who swiftly runs up cups his hands into the water, slurps a mouthful, and runs off again. The man stares for a moment at the boy, and then at his cup, the gears in his head turning. Then, to the shock of those standing by, he lifts his hand in the air and dashes his cup to the ground, slurps a handful of water through a crazed smile, and exits stage left, stamping his feet and muttering loudly about having too many damned cups. End scene. This character is Diogenes the dog, the quintessential cynic, and we will see plenty of him in forthcoming episodes. However, there is too much to say about him, and our focus today really is the cup he so viciously destroyed. So we have two stories about cups and the attachments or relationships that we can form with them. Marcus proposes that we interact with the cup with forethought and acknowledgement that like everything else in this world, it is temporary, borrowed, and will have to one day be returned. But what are we to make of Diogenes and his actions towards the cup? Diogenes and the other cynics were famous for their poverty, giving up all their worldly possessions in order to pursue a difficult life according to nature, and wage an endless war against the cruel blows of fate. In this view, Diogenes sees the mug that had escaped his reason until this critical moment as a vector for the future pains that Marcus warned us about. The cup might chip or break. The affection we once felt for it and utility we received from it could suddenly and painfully be revoked by capricious and fickle fate. But the cynic proposition is to punch back and think, fate cannot take my cup if I have no cup and I will be saved the trouble of meditating or pontificating about how my cup will ultimately be lost, returned or otherwise, and I will be hardened for it and made resilient in future if I am more accustomed to being thirsty. Sure, I pay the price of looking like a madman, but it's better than being one. Now, the beauty of living in a post-Diogenes world is that we have stories of his ridiculous behavior to learn from, and we don't have to go around performing our philosophy in the streets. We don't even have to smash our belongings. We can donate them to various charities, or better yet, never acquire them in the first place. 
Yes, I know that it's basically heresy to suggest that we don't buy stuff or win stuff or make stuff or need stuff because stuff is so easy to come by these days. You yourself probably have a mug for every day of the week or more. One for coffee, one for tea, one for soup. A dusty one that sits on a dusty shelf alone by the dusty books because it's too pretty to use. Don't get me wrong, I'm no cynical mug saint. When my now wife moved in with me, we had two people's worth of too many mugs. And after a surprisingly difficult conversation, I drove them out of the house like St. Patrick. A year later, when we remodeled the kitchen, we tossed the remaining mugs so she could buy a matching set. It was so easy, too. We are so fortunate to live in a world that has placed so much importance on mugs. We've built factories on every continent to churn them out by the millions. The oldest mugs are dated to 5000 BC, which means that mugs are so important to humans that we chose to invent them before the wheel, before democracy, before the cure for cancer. Priorities, right? The lesson of cynicism is that beyond our relationship to the mug that Mark is focused on, the mug itself can be an impediment to living wisely if we let it. Between Tanner and I, we've now already talked about mugs for going on 20 minutes, and outside of children and spouses, we haven't mentioned any of the other things that are sitting in Amazon warehouses waiting to obstruct your virtuous life. If Marcus Aurelius wants you to meditate on all of your relationships to all of your belongings and loved ones, you will be thinking about stuff for a very long time. Time that could be better spent, according to Diogenes, actually living. For Diogenes, this meant sunbathing, masturbating in public, stealing food from temples, and yelling at strangers. But the point of cynicism isn't to be like Diogenes. It's to untangle ourselves from the web of ideas and objects that are preventing us from living wisely and according to nature. And if getting rid of a mug or anything else that could be blocking your path to living a better, more virtuous, healthier life according to nature, then smash it. Thank you for your time and attention on this very first episode of what I hope will be a helpful and reoccurring series. And thank you, Tanner, for allowing me to articulate a non-Stoic viewpoint and contribute to the work you are doing on practical Stoicism. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Practical Stoicism. I hope you enjoyed it. If you haven't yet, consider leaving this podcast a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or Podchaser.com, or wherever it is you can leave a review where you listen to this podcast. Also, if you want to get rid of ads, check the show notes for a link to stoicism.supercast.com and get rid of those ads. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, take care.